And he joins me now, Jeremiah. How are you doing today? I'm uh, as well as can be expected under these circumstances, but uh, okay. Yeah, it's a different, it's definitely a different time for everybody. It's a different holiday season. Are you a, are you a big holiday guy? Do you get into the, into the festivities typically? We do. Uh, we, you know, yearly host a Christmas party here. We are very social and we cook a lot. And this year, not so much. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to be the last person that gets COVID. <laughs> You don't. We're right here at the finish line. You know what I mean? Oh, we're well, right I think we're far, but hopefully. you want to hold on. Yeah. Hopefully. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to be that guy. What is, what is, um, what is though, even under these circumstances, but under normal holiday seasons, like what's your big go-to thing? Do you have a certain tradition that you like to do? Generally, we host a Christmas party on Christmas Day. So when everybody's done with presents, family, and that kind of chaos, they come over here. They eat more, they drink more, and we have a good time. So, <laughs> and we also have it have a, our party for our kind of so-called orphans, you know, people whose parents may be far away. And anyway, so we've been doing this for many years, and uh, this year will be a little different. Yeah, obviously, it's you know, like we said before, not not the normal circumstances. But we're we're excited to talk to you today because um, not only with the holiday season, a lot of great holiday cinema always uh, always happening. And you, you've directed one of the most classic or the most classic holiday film of all time, in my opinion. Um, and I want to talk to you about that. But first, um, I want to kind of get into a little bit of your career um, prior to that. I know that um, you've been in film and, and, and directing. I think you did some music videos back in the day, if, if I have that right. Tell me a little bit about your background, Jeremiah. Uh, I began as a, uh, a photographer. Um, effectively, I was an artist. Uh, uh, I was living in Toronto at the time. And uh, I'd started a gallery uh, with some friends and was uh, really focused on printmaking and photography, had several shows. One of the shows that I, that I had done, a solo show, um, uh, you know, was quite popular. And, and uh, one of the people who came to it was a big wing at McCann Erickson. And he said, hey, you want to do a picture for us for some wine or some booze? Of course, you had me at booze, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, um, and they paid me as much as they made the whole year before. And so uh, through that, um, I started to get more work as a commercial photographer. And uh, one of the gigs that I got was a fashion gig, which uh, I kind of dove into. And before long, I was a uh, kind of bona fide fashion photographer working in Milan for Italian Vogue, where I did uh, uh, many years of that and uh, were back and forth from New York, uh, where I had moved. And um, in New York, I, I obviously was doing commercial photography and then was uh, kind of um, scouted for a commercial director's career. And... That, that was fun since uh, when I was at university, I went to McGill University in Montreal and uh, studied theater. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, the dramaturgy of it all was not uh, very, you know, difficult for me to kind of plunge into. And of course, the photography and the uh, framing and visual kind of iconography uh, were kind of second nature to me. I had to learn how to edit. And um, I, I remember my very first commercial where I shot like 50 takes of a girl drinking a glass of wine. Then I got into the cutting room and it was like, yeah, take one looks really good. <laughs> 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 I, I, I always use this on film sets. So I go, okay, print one and 50. <laughs> so, um, but through that, uh, I had a kind of a, a nice, strong kind of international career directing commercials and then that led to uh, an awareness uh, in Hollywood of um, my potential, I guess they saw it. And uh, through that, I, I started to direct and Christmas Vacation was my first. Well, so did you ever have any inclination when you were at university? I know you, you were a photographer, but did you ever want to get into you know, features and, and any sort of film? Or was it just, hey, you know, I like, I like doing my photography and then this is something that just kind of came about like you described? No, um, it, it wasn't that, you know, I was one of those kids who's like, yeah, my dad gave me this Super 8 camera and I made like my version of Star Wars when I was eight. And <laughs> No, it wasn't like that for me. Um, 
you know, being being a, a polite Canadian uh, with at that time no industry what to, uh, to speak of, uh, I couldn't ever imagine how one would break into it. Though I did, uh, I did inquire. I try to push into to the National Film Board, which was the operative kind of entry at that point. Um, also, uh, I studied with John Grierson, um, who those of us who want to Google him, he's the man who um, he started uh, the British Film Institute, I think it was, and, and coined the word documentary. And he was, you know, was in his 80s, and he had taught uh, a large class. And I was lucky enough to be his assistant in the final years of his life. And he did uh, small amounts of um, kind of a, you know, group, a couple of classes with seven of us in. And that was very inspiring because he had screened a lot of the classic documentaries. And he, he produced documentaries, Night Train and, uh, I'm sorry, Mail Train, I think one very, very famous one, Nanook of the North, uh, those, uh, you know, he knew Lenny Reifenstahl and, Charlie Chaplin it was an amazing character. Wow. And so he really did whet my appetite for filmmaking in general, but I, I didn't have a, a kind of a strong uh, way into the industry. Of course, um, you know, when I got to the US, it was, um, you know, as one would imagine, there was a lot of opportunities here if one would kind of focus and, and do it. But for me, like, to, to, to hear your story, it's actually really awesome because I, th I try to think of earlier this year, I, I published my first book, right? I, I, and when I got, when I made the pitch and they said, hey, you got the job, you can write this book. I was like, man, this is awesome. This is a great opportunity. How do you write a book? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure on how to do this, right? And I had to really figure my way out through it and make many mistakes and spend many nights typing away at a keyboard with pages that were never going to be seen. And a lot of it was trial and error. Um, for you, when you, and I want to get to the movie itself, but when you got the, let me ask you this. How did you, how did you get on it? I know you said you got on people's radars, but did you have to make a pitch and saying, this is my you know, vision for lack of a better term for this film. And then when you got it, were you like, what do I do now? Uh, it was, you know, very different than that experience. Um, I, I, you know, I was doing a lot of commercials at that time and I was uh, flying, I think from London to New York or New York to London. I was reading the New York Times and I had read this article. Um, it was an interview with Stanley Kubrick and uh, it was, on American filmmaking and on his new film that he was promoting. And um, he had mentioned in the article that when asked about American filmmaking, he said, oh, my favorite American filmmaking is like these Budweiser commercials that I get on these tapes that they send me when I watch football because he was a big football fan. They used to send the VHS tapes to London. And I was reading this and I went like, Jeez, those are my commercials. I made those commercials. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it didn't take long uh, after that. I got a call from, you know, the call, you know, the police hold for Steven Spielberg. And you go like, oh, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Anyway, um, they brought me in, Kathy Kennedy, Steven Spielberg, Frank Marshall Lee. They brought me into the office uh, there at Amblin. And um, I was thrilled just to meet. And, and they, you know, Stephen said that, you know, when they'd ask people about commercials, um, your name had come up frequently and they had an idea to do a movie um, about the Apollo Theater in New York, uh, Amateur Night in particular. Um, and uh, I had just really moved from New York to LA. <laughs> said to myself, I should have come earlier if this is how it is. Here. Um, uh, would I would I be interested in developing a sort of a, an interesting musical format based on um, the amateur night at the Apollo? Um, and it was before the advent of the commercialization of the Apollo on TV, etc. cetera. Uh, so it was still pretty uh, focused on the neighborhood, et cetera. Of course, now I think like, oh, who would ask a white guy to do that? It's ridiculous. <laughs> but 
but then we weren't so PC and I jumped at the chance to develop this movie. And it was a small, I wanted to do a small movie for Amblin. Didn't want to spend a lot of dough, wanted control over it. I got myself a great team uh, with the help of Steven and some of the cinematographers and crew people who I had worked with a lot over the years in commercials. And uh, it was, um, and I remember uh, the, you know, the head of the studio at that time, it was Warner's asking me when I kind of turned in the script, well, this is a small movie. We should make a big movie with movie stars here. And, and the problem is it was about unknowns and a lot of the drama was about, well, would they make it or not? And in, right. in, in my story, some did, even though they were very talented and some didn't. Um, you could never tell uh, where, if somebody had talent was on stage, they could be booed off or they could be applauded, whatever. Uh, and, you know, he, I had made commercials with Whitney Houston and, you know, they said, you can get her. And, you know, we'll, we'll, anyway, I didn't want to do that. Uh, they said, well, we're going to develop it anyway. They went ahead and they, they did develop it. It didn't turn out very well. By that time, the Apollo had become commercial anyway. It, it evolved a, a very strong relationship between me and Warner Brothers uh, with the execs there. And I guess they thought, well, I guess this guy uh, should direct a movie for us. At the time, I was thinking, oh, they just didn't want to hurt my feelings. So they're sending me scripts. Of course, little did I know about Hollywood. They don't care about my feelings. <laughs> anyway, um, so they had sent me a bunch of scripts, uh, one after the other. I wasn't crazy about them. In fact, I remember they, they had sent me one uh, and I said, and they said, oh, you know, Clint Eastwood is going to do this. He says, you, you know, you should, we'd love you to, to, to read it and think about it. I said, there's no way that Clint Eastwood is going to make a movie called Pink Cadillac. I'm like, it's not going to happen. It's so silly course you know they were sending me their their slate but one of the scripts that finally arrived was john hughes's script of christmas vacation and i read it i'd never done any comedy my work was always kind of long lens kind of moody fast cut kind of the opposite and um i took a you know i i I just took a shot and said, yeah, I'll do it. I, 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 it's the, it's so funny. The script is so good. And uh, lo and behold, they gave it to me. Well, that's an incredible story. I love the Kubrick talking about you in an interview while you're reading it on the plane to London. That's like a once in a million story. That's incredible. Yeah, um, believe me. Yeah, I'm sure that you know better than I, but just hearing that, being the guy that happened to direct those Budweiser commercials from one of the greatest directors of all time. Stanley oh, Kubrick. yeah. And later, I, you know, I, I did get a chance to meet him. So oh, you did? It, How did that yeah. go? Oh, it was great because we were both shooting. Uh, I was shooting at Pinewood, so was he when he was doing uh, Eyes Wide Shot. And uh, I, I had known um, his AD. I knew Nicole. Um, I had met Tom. There was a very, very tiny crew. And um, and so it was very late at night. I had wrapped and the AD said, oh, yeah, why don't you come over? You know, it was a very close set. I just had to walk across the the lot and uh, just spent, spent some time there on that beautiful New York set. It was fabulous. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. But, but, but so you read this uh, John Hughes script. Obviously, John Hughes um, at that time was on a great run. Um, and, and would continue to be on a great run into the into the late 90s of, of writing and producing and directing iconic films. Um, but the Vacation series was already an established comedy vehicle for Chevy Chase. They had the, the two prior to Christmas yeah. Vacation. Was that intimidating for you at all, especially for your first feature? Oh, I'm going to direct a sequel of an already popular franchise? Well, it, it was... Uh... For me personally, um, you know, it, it gave me pause even to accept the gig at all, you know, feeling, oh, I don't want to make a sequel for God's sake. <laughs> but um, I, there's a couple of, of interesting, first of all, I knew because John had tipped me that he had written this as a short story for the Lampoon where he was writing, you know, a while ago called Christmas 59. Mm -hmm. So it was a standalone idea of a man who wanted to do well by his family and in so doing almost destroys his family. And um, so it was a great idea for a film. And John's script was fantastic uh, in terms of how he adapted his own screenplay. Um, I just made a decision that I was going to do my own unique movie that I would not watch the first two at all. I hadn't seen them and I still haven't seen them. 
Really? Wow. I guess it's just a conceit now, but, <laughs> but, but I hadn't because I didn't, I really didn't want it to influence uh, my thinking about the movie. I just wanted to do whatever movie I had in my head. Um, so on the technical end, I was not uh, intimidated. Um, I had already evolved a relationship with the studio. Uh, a lot of my team were familiar to me through commercials and all the rest of it. Uh, and casting was nothing short of like a blast um, outside of, you know, I was got to work with Chevy and Beverly, but Randy also. And then, but I got to cast the kids, Johnny Galecki. I just made him a star. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. That's a joke for those who can't see my face. Um, but all of them had great talent. I, I surrounded myself with great classical actors, uh, you know, Diane Ladd, uh, E.G. Marshall, John Randolph, uh, Bill Hickey, uh, May Castell, Betty Boop, who is Betty Boop, for God's sakes, for right. those who are interested in the history of cinema. Um, and, and, and I felt very, very um, profoundly supported and profoundly safe uh, in the environment, uh, uh, despite the difficulties of, of shooting. Uh, uh, John had, had gone, he was uh, on set for a few days uh, early and then went back to Chicago to direct, I think it was uh, Uncle Buck, I think, um, if memory serves me well. And um, so I was left on my own to kind of sink or swim. I had really good, uh, uh, production team. Um, and I was shooting on the back lot and in these kind of amazing um, studios uh, that, you know, had housed some of my most influence, you know, films that influenced me over the years. So I, I was I was just uh, trying to enjoy every single moment of it. And I did even well, the difficult moments. Yeah. And I'm sure that, I'm sure there were I'm sure there were ups and downs throughout the, the, the process. Um, you know, historically, and and I I'm only speaking from an observer's standpoint because I've never had the the um, one on one interaction. But uh, depending on who you speak to, Chevy Chase can either be the greatest actor you ever work with, or he can be a little bit difficult at times. Uh, what was your experience like with Chevy? Because I feel out of all the vacation films, and I know you haven't seen them all, uh, but but I have. I feel like this one he came off the most likable, but also the funniest that he was in any of them. So how was he working with on set? Well, since he wanted me to direct it, he was he was incredibly uh, malleable and responsive. Uh, he has great comic instincts um, and Second gifts to none, in that really. way. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that that was good. Um, in, in just in terms of of how uh, how that kind of experience plays out, um, you know. I always came to the set as a director, so I, I am not intimidated by um, potential difficult actors. Um, I treat every actor uh, the same. Um, I will, depending on how much responsibility they have on the movie, I will give them a huge amount of support. My job is to make them feel uh, safe and energized in terms of what they're uh, ability to bring the best of their work to to the set, and I, you know, I, I, I got a reputation for working with difficult actors, Sharon Stone, Sean Connery. I mean, I, I have worked with people who have tremendous focused egos. Trust me, but uh, you know, so do I. So, uh, I, if I lose control of the set, I feel I can't direct it. So I'm never, uh, I'm never intimidated by that. Um, there is. Uh, it's not my way or the highway. Uh, that's not really what I'm saying. But I do want to provide a very clear and concise direction um, to my decision making. And any note that I give is not coming from a place of ego. It's not coming from a place of, you know, my way or the highway. It, it, it really is about how can we explore this moment, this gag, this joke, this emotion to make it brighter, better, harder, uh, subtler, whatever that is. So it, it's more uh, like I'm jamming with uh, jazz players or conducting an orchestra. I, you know, um, I'm just there as a, as a roadmap, but I want my roadmap to be as clear as possible. Okay, so 
Um, it sounds like when you say you're like a jazz player in, in some regard, did you allow for a lot of improvisation on the set? Because I feel like with comedies, you almost have to allow the, the actors to feel, at, feel it out a little bit. Were you okay with improvisation during the film? Yeah, in fact, um, I, I have to love improv, but it's got to be based on um, a, a kind of a, a, a clear screenplay. So again, I had the benefit of a John Hughes screenplay that was phenomenal. We would come, we would read through the scene, we would rehearse it, I would block it, and then we would shoot it. Uh, once I had I had it in the can that I was going like, that's great. Then it was like, okay, go nuts. Be there. That, that little moment that you, you had, you know, run with that moment. And so, yeah, we did that. Yeah. I, I feel like you almost have to allow for the comedy to breathe and, and, and to feel the ebb and flow of it, sure. especially with a comedy. With a drama, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more rigid. And it's more controlled. It's a lot tighter, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the lines are written with specific intent to further the story, yeah. whereas comedy, it's more the scene being set for the jokes, uh, if, if, if you follow what I'm saying. Well, I, I, yes, uh, in this particular film, um, I, I have become quite uh, um, obsessed, if you will, with landing the emotion of it and landing the heartfelt uh, moments. John uh, was very, very good about creating sort of the American sentimentality moments, which I think are are good in a Christmas movie. You know that tugging of the heart strings, and 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 so I really uh, focused a lot of my attention and detail and nuance on those moments because I knew if I I knew the movie was going to play funny. But if people didn't care, the only thing they would ask themselves after it it uh, it ended was, uh, "What do you feel like, uh, Indian or Chinese? Let's go have some good dinner," you know, rather than like, "Wow, that was uh, that landed. That was an experience." And and so um, that became uh, a lot of my method. And you know what? That definitely comes through. It definitely comes through. And and, and the fact that you said that makes me really now look back at all the vacation movies and figure out why is this the one that the most people talk about and it is the only story where it's grounded in this sense of sentimentality around the holidays true um but as you described earlier a guy who really wants this christmas to be great but ends up ruining it all for his family and there's something so relatable about that you know everybody wants their gift to be the best and they want to put the smile on the face but then when you open up that gift on christmas day and you get a new pair of socks you might be somewhat deflated but you still <laughs> appreciate the effort at times and i think that that was what clark griswold uh really was he it was the effort that everybody appreciated although the follow-through might not have been the best was that an accurate description well, yes, and I think it goes beyond Christmas. I mean, sometimes we have this kind of innate desire to do something that is so so um, uh, brightly burning within that we uh, lose sight of its impact as we kind of buzzsaw through the obstacles in order to achieve it. Uh, you know, there may be bodies lying all over the place in terms of pain we cause, um, irresponsibility. I, uh, there's all kinds of, of, of ways that we can look back on our behaviors for good reason. In other words, it's, it's often like doing bad things for good reason. And uh, that's always a moral judgment, um, you know, and, and, you know, obviously plays very well at Christmas. Um, was, is there a particular scene or anything? There's a few aspects about the movie I want to ask you about specifically, but is there a particular scene that you're most proud of? You know, when I was talking about my book, there's a particular chapter that I really love and I always tell everybody, oh, this was my favorite chapter. Was there a particular scene that you really love doing? And when you look back now, you're like, God, that, that really had everything that I wanted. Uh, there, there is, I mean, there's a few things that I really like and I don't, you know, I haven't watched the movie a lot. Um, so, I mean, that's, uh, you know, when it's done, it's done. I, I understand. Uh, yeah. But, 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 um, there's a scene where, uh, Chevy, who's already demonstrated, uh, his, uh, kind of obsession with putting as many lights on the house as possible and working all that magic and et cetera, et cetera. 
families gathered outside, everyone's waiting, drum roll. I remember drum roll, please. <laughs> I think that was improv. But, but um, when he throws those pieces of wire together and plugs it in and nothing happens, uh, the audience, and, and I, I go back to the very first preview screening where I was ashen for fear <laughs> that my career was completely over by the time this movie would stop playing. And I was sitting next to Terry Simmel, who was running the studio. And at that moment, when those plugs came together, no lights came on, the entire audience went, Oh, they just sighed collectively. And I, I didn't expect that. I, I, I expected that people would feel, oh God, he's, he's, he fucked up again. Mm -hmm. But they expressed it as a collective theater. And at that point, I knew that that movie would be successful because I knew that the audience was with him despite how cartoony and crazy and broad the comedy was, they were with him emotionally at that moment. And I remember Terry Simmel turned to me and nodded and I turned to him and it was like, oh, maybe I'll get to direct again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. So there's definitely that. And of course the cat. <laughs> oh yeah. The, 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 the cat moment is great, but honestly, whenever, um, you know, everything kind of explodes at the end with the with the uh, with the cousin Eddie's chemical waste or what have you, and then um, the grandmother starts singing the national anthem. Is one of those scenes that always makes funny. me laugh so hard. Um, and then they, the the fact that they, everyone goes with it, everyone <laughs> yeah. decides to go with it. You know, okay, well, you know what? Let's just go with crazy grandma on this moment. Let's sing the national anthem. It's just that was great. It was great. Um, oh, and then the other thing you and you mentioned the animatedness of the character. Where did the idea for the opening credits come from? Because uh, not only is that good, song good great, that good opening credits. credit scene is so good, and it's something that isn't seen in movies at all today anymore. Any sort of opening credits, you're almost right after the movie starts, you're in the thrust of it. But that was a great opening. You know, I've never been asked that question before, and there's a really, I think, very funny story attached to it. Um, the um, I always wanted 2D animated credits over the film, and I did for a very specific reason because I wanted the audience to to before they even hit the road in that first shot, I wanted them to know that they're watching a cartoon. I, in other words, if for any reason people thought they were watching something dramatic, I wanted them to give themselves permission to watch something silly and uh, or based on something, but not reality. So I really wanted that. So I asked the studio, I said, you know, I have this idea. I want to do some animation. Here's some samples that I want. There's a company that I think would do a good job. And um, I remember the, the response was like, are you out of your mind? You know how much that costs? That's a lot of money to do an animated title baked in, you know, all of that. They said, no, you know, you give us something else. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to give you something else. All right. So I went away and I made a opening title sequence that could not have been cheaper. It looked very much like a French art film of the 60s. Uh, it was 133, almost square in format. It was black with a lot of dust and scratches. The white titles were shaking like, <laughs> like projecting projector uh, flop. Uh, so, and all the titles were in French. <laughs> they were like, so it looked like a French art film. The music that I chose was Santa Claus is Coming to Town, sung by an ancient uh, Jamaican in heavy patois. And uh, I put that together and, and I said, and by the way, 
I fell in love with these titles because I thought, you know, with all their advertising and all of that, you sit in the theater and all of a sudden what looks like a French art film is now playing before it goes wide. With that music, you can hardly understand the lyrics of the song. I showed it to Warner Brothers and they were like, when can you get started on that animated <laughs> opening? <laughs> So, so, so you almost, you almost tricked them into getting what you wanted. They're like, this I would have gone in. I, I, I would have gone in either direction and did, <laughs> but uh, I'll save that for another movie, maybe. The, uh, um, the, the but, but you're right. That that opening title scene. It, and now that you say that about you wanted to get people in the mindset of this is a zaniness. There's a zaniness to this film. Yeah. It's not grounded in in your normal reality. It makes perfect sense. Um, and, and, and I think that that's such a unique choice that I, to this day, until you said that, I never understood why it was there. I just always loved it. And now it makes sense within the format of the film. I mean, even at the very beginning when they're driving to get the Christmas tree and he's under the 18 wheeler, that's a very, that's a very cartoony like thing. And then yeah. the big tree on the small car, these are very cartoony elements and we're sure. just coming out of an animation. This and great. by the way, and you counterpoint that with that beautiful song by, by Mavis Staples. Uh, you know what I mean? I think Prince was involved in producing it, as uh, I remember Gary Marsh, who was the head of music at Warner's, had put it up, put us all together. Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think she did an amazing job. And then you also, you talked about the brilliance of the cast, uh, not only Beverly D'Angelo, Chevy Chase, we, you, and you, you named several great actors who are in it, but Julia Louis Dreyfus um, played a really great role in that in that movie. We, this is really before Seinfeld took, or was before Seinfeld took off, and um, she was great. What was in your mind the purpose of those two characters? In your mind, because I've I've read like internet Reddit streams of what people actually thought that they were supposed to be. But in your mind, you're the director. What was the purpose of the character of those two characters? Well, I I like the fact that they were as opposite to the Griswold family as you could get. Uh, you know, it, it really didn't matter which individual you chose or which part of the family and which dynamic. This was a, you know, remember when people was like, oh, yuppies, remember that, yuppies? Yuppie. Mm -hmm. They were yuppies uh, in that derogatory, uh, you know, vernacular. Um, and, so there was a joke about how unrelaxed they were about Christmas. So they were, they were the, I guess they were the humbug of it all. <laughs> if there had to be a humbug, they were the humbug. And uh, yeah, I mean, I thought they, they were great. Of course, you know, Julia, she was brilliant then. She was brilliant now. She is brilliant now. What can I say? Yeah, I've I've said about Julia Louis Drivers, she might be the most talented comedian. Um may, maybe maybe ever. She's definitely up on the on the Mount Rushmore, in my opinion, of just the comedic work that she's been able to do and continue to do uh in different always, varieties of always, formats. Yeah. I mean she, you know, I became aware of her on uh from Saturday Night Live. She was there for a few years and um that's why I cast her. Oh, you cast her directly from Saturday Night Live. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't remember if she had left the show or not, but I, she was like, it was just like, let's get her to do this. This is perfect. Yeah, she was an obvious megastar in the, you know, the preface, precipice of, of megastardom. Um, and when the film came out, like you said, and you, you saw test screenings, but it essentially, did you think that it, it was going to enter that lexicon of Christmas movies? Because um, now... It's it's you know your your film Christmas Vacation, Home Alone, A Christmas Story. There's a few others that are staples. I mean, I pass a billboard every day on on the freeway that says uh, it's a it's a it's a billboard for an energy company that says you know decorate like a Griswold, pay like a Scrooge. You know, <laughs> um, so it's in the public consciousness. This is a thing that everybody is yeah. aware of and references. Did you have any inclination upon release that that was a possibility or even a probability? Um, it, it's a, it's a complicated answer. I mean, it, obviously not, right. you know, how, how many movies kind of enter that particular path that becomes perennial where multi-generations know the language of it, et cetera. 
and I, you know, I can't even take ownership of it, even though I directed it and you know, somewhat responsible for the movie. Um, once the movie is done, you kind of give it to the world. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with timing and the very specific way it kind of just fits through a crack in the culture. But the one thing that uh, I have to say, and I've said this before in interviews, um, my style of filmmaking as a commercial director before I made that movie was extraordinarily focused on a certain visual vernacular that one would consider more hip at the time. And, you know, I described it as having longer lenses, faster cutting, monochrome lighting, you know, that kind of vibe. When I did that movie, um, you know, I made a conscious choice to use very different kind of lensing, uh, very different kinds of lighting for me, more open, broader uh, lighting. Um, slow down um, the pace of cutting uh, and make decisions based on hair, makeup, wardrobe, soundtrack, blocking, etc., that would have a timeless quality for the story. And it wasn't because I, I, I thought, oh, if I do this, then, you know, in 30 years, people are still going to enjoy the movie. No, I, I, I did it because the movie itself felt classic in and of itself from the screenplay, that it was universal, that you could have made this movie in the 30s, you could make it again today. Uh, you know, some of the technology and the lighting would be different. Some of the ways we approach it would be different, but the essence of it would be the same. And I wanted very much not to make the movie of the moment way back in 1989, but something that had no age to it, that you wouldn't really know when it was made. You know, I tried the same thing on Benny and June, which was my next film. Um, and, and to that extent, uh, you know, because some films, you really want to drive the kind of of now, that hip quotient, that, you know, that kind of kinetic experience that, that is just, you know, full of wow. This one I did not, I, I consciously set out not to do that. Um, so I think that it's kind of more classic aesthetic writ large contributed to its universality over the years. But again, I think there's, there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of who looked at that movie when it first came out and what did it say to them that they wanted to show their kids. And, and then again, uh, I mean, I brought my seven-year-old, she was six last year, um, granddaughter, when they re-released the movie. And I, we went to Universal, you know, City Walk, into a theater, paid and bought tickets, <laughs> and sat there. And, uh, and it was, for me, it just the most tremendous experience, especially in a full theater. It was so fun. Uh, it was one of the first times I ever really got to see the movie, um, objectively, or somewhat objectively. And, you know, I thought it was pretty funny. I think I think it's a little bit more than pretty funny. Um, a, a couple more questions for you, and then and then you've been so generous with your time. Um, in regards to its almost immediate success, and then you then its um, ability to uh, enter into the pop culture lexicon and, and and be one of the go to movies. And I know there was a you know, Vegas Vacation, then there was something with Cousin Eddie, but it seems like out of all the vacation movies, this one seemed the most obvious to do a direct sequel to. Because when you think about the other John Hughes property um, in, in the vein of Christmas, you think of Home Alone, there was Home Alone 2, and then subsequently Home Alone 3. I feel like the Christmas Vacation was, was needed of a direct sequel. Was there ever any discussion of that? No, I, I think part of it is you need John Hughes to write it if you're going to capture that. I mean, you know, there, you know, there are plenty of writers today who are incredibly talented who could write it. But also, you know, there's a you know, there's a cynicism of it uh, about making a sequel on something um, like that. Like, why? I think you want to make a sequel on movies that can be improved. Um, you know, I always think that that uh, when you look at Alien and Aliens, I mean, 
both are fantastic. You, you can't say, you know, Alien was better than Aliens. No, I mean, they're both phenomenal movie. Um, you know, uh, can we say that, you know, Fast 8 is better than <laughs> Fast and the Furious 1? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's bigger, you know. Um, there's got to be a reason for it. And uh, if there's no good reason for it, then it becomes commercial. And I think people smell the authenticity of things nowadays more than ever. Um, you know, I mean, we're on the verge of seeing Wonder Woman 84. I watched Wonder Woman. I thought it was really great. I'm so looking forward to Wonder Woman 84 just because of the way, first of all, I think Patty Jenkins is a fantastic director. And number two, um, I, I do think that when you twist it a bit, make a prequel, reset it in an age and are able to capture the music and the hairstyles and the wardrobe and whatnot to freshen it up, even in a kind of retro way, it becomes really, really fun. And so, you know, I, I think there's a Christmas vacation maybe set in the 20s, you know, with gangsters, right? I, 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 I don't, I, you know, what would Al Capone do for his I mean, I don't know. It, it would be an interesting prospect. Um, and, and Jeremiah, you've been so uh, generous with your time, but I want to ask you about your podcast. You said that you have a podcast. You have a lovely uh, little setup over there that we were discussing prior to rolling. Tell the people about your podcast and how they can get in contact with you. Oh, we, we do a po we do a podcast called the Future of Photography. It's uh, there's there's um, four of us. We're on different continents. We all bring different approaches to our image making, and you can find us at your you know your podcast uh, dealer <laughs> anywhere. Future of Photography. Uh, we do it once a week, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And you know, it, it really sm speaks more to my um, career as an artist, separate. Than, than me as a filmmaker, writer, director, TV maker, whatever I'm to happen to be doing, especially this year where, you know, we are, we are kind of homebound a lot. And um, so there's that. Awesome. Well, yeah, well, it's definitely, and then are you on any social sites where the people can check you out or are you just doing the podcast? No, I do. Instagram is my kind of go-to because of my photography and it's Jeremiah underscore Chechik. That's it. You know. All right. Well, for those Jeremiah, of you who can spell. <laughs> for those of you it. who can spell, right? Well, I'm sure they'll find it one way or another. And we'll, we'll put a we'll put a link and, and My feeling is if you if you can't, then you really didn't want to go that bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for the interview. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I find it funny that ESPN is doing it. You know, I thought, oh, yeah, they'll ask me about the 77 Yankees and Bronx is burning, right? <laughs> Well, you know, um, well, we're, we're, we're big pop culture fans uh, uh, over here at ESPN. And, of course, Don't I know it. this is a massive pop culture film. Um, one, one of the classics. Do you, do, you rank it as, do you rank it as the best Christmas movie? I know it's a little, a little hard for you to maybe make that uh, assumption. But is it up there for you, uh, objectively speaking? My favorite. Uh, you want to know my, my favorite Christmas movie? Bad Santa. <laughs> That's a great one. That's a great one. Which, which, by the way, its subsequent sequel, not as great. That is one I could say the sequel wasn't as great as the first one. Yeah, I did not see the sequel because I, I didn't want to harm my experience of the first one, which because I had heard it's not that good. But, oh, my God, Bad Santa. That's a winner. Jeremiah a winner says it's me. a winner. Well, Jeremiah, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Good luck with the show.